Open your Bibles to Isaiah 55. I decided to do something different. Last Monday night, I was expressing my concerns for the lack of participation by individuals that I call freeloaders out there. And I asked you, and I opened up for discussion, listen. I was just curious to see what my faithful really out there that follow this ministry and what we do here would have to say. I was honestly looking for opinions concerning what I should do, concerning what was perplexing me now for several months. And I'm still perplexed by it. But I still don't know what I'm going to do. I had many different messages during the program, after the program, days later, even as of today. Let them expressing themselves what they think what I should probably do, because I ask for your opinion in the matter. And 99% of them were respectively done in order, which I expected most of you would do. I'm not really mad or angry or disappointed by any of the responses that I received. Not a single one. I did make a comment on one that used Isaiah 55.11, of course, at that time. They didn't reference Isaiah 55.11, they just kind of paraphrased the scripture. And I mentioned that it's, that was a scripture that's used quite often, most of the time taken out of context. Christians love to use that scripture. Only when it applies to a certain agenda. Most Christians use it in a general sense. Or, for instance, as a pre-game warm-up to get people to prompt prompt no, to prompt people excuse me to speak boldly when they're trying to evangelize whether it's on the streets or share the information to whoever and they'll get their congregation they'll get their people all riled up using this verse and they'll say for they know that God's word will not return void as it says here in the scripture, but it will accomplish something. Now, I'm not saying that that's necessarily wrong with such a statement as that, because we all know that the Word of God usually does have some effect on individuals, one way or the other, whether good or whether bad, on whoever hears it. And it's been passed on and repeated so often, and most people don't even know the reference or the context where this verse came from and what it actually says. Now, the verse itself is found in Isaiah 55 11, but you have to back up to, let's just back it up to verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways. Who's doing the speaking? Saith the Lord. Saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, 
so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but water the earth, and make it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void. This is God speaking about his word. But it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Now, the context is the, the future of Jerusalem and what God was instructing Jeremiah to say to a rebellious people. Now, so the thrust of what's being said here in these verses is when the Lord says something, when he sends forth his word, to do something, it will be done. And in no way it will be toward or returned unto the Lord. Void. And the Christians around the world have used this particular verse, as powerful as it is, as some blanket assurance or defense that no matter how we put God's word out there, it will work. as it's commonly done. It offers false assurance and is mishandling scripture. It's promise box mentality. And it's a powerful scripture. Well, the problem is you can't pick and choose when it will work or when it will, won't work. Because it says, when God said something, it's going to happen. And what Christians confuse is, when God says something that he says, especially throughout history, when he says certain things are going to happen, it's going to happen. It's not going to return unto him void. But he says a lot more things in the scriptures whether it's instruction or anything else. Through his word that requires a receiving participant to act on that word. And if that receiving participant doesn't act on that word, it's not God turning unto his word void it's the participant doing it to give you an example let's take this verse and read it again verse 11 so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth it shall not return unto me void if you think Jesus was God's mouthpiece 2,000 years ago, then he, and we've covered this plenty of times, in Matthew, lay up your treasures in heaven. And as I pointed out, it wasn't a suggestion. It wasn't something if you feel like doing. It was a command. Jesus forth put through that word by the means of his lips to his disciples, and now we have it in print that we could read what he actually said. 
So if it doesn't happen, if someone does not lay up their treasures in heaven as instructed by Jesus, does that mean that the word given by Jesus, the Son of God, returns unto him void? No. It's the participant that received that word that made it void for his lack of participation. Really, his lack, well, his non-existence, understanding of God's word where it says this is to be an obedient act that Christ commanded for us to follow. They returned God's word void. Not God. They did. Because if they practiced what he said to do, guess what would be happening up there? Treasures would be laid up, storing in the heavenlies. And the promise is he will reward us for being obedient to that act. We didn't return the word void because we were obedient. If we decide not to do it, then guess what? We made void the word of God, not God himself. And there's the difference, my friend. That's why you just can't rattle off verses like most Christians do and apply it to anything and everything as long as it fits your general blanket of, ass of assurance of how you interpret the verse. There's too many private interpretations running loose that don't make any sense. I had someone else, a very faithful HOF. Listen, you think I want to charge for the teaching? That's the last thing I want to do. But I'm sick of freeloaders. We send out back-to-back -back messages, I think a day apart, giving messages. Outside of the faithful, we didn't get one response. People's hearts are hardened, my friend. Mostly brought on by all the nonsense that's preached out there. Whatever version of the prosperity doctrine that's out there running wild. Somebody else? I'm not going to go to it. You can read it. Here. Well, let's just go to Matthew 10. Gave a suggestion. Scriptures to look at, like Matthew. And this, it's in the other Gospels, too, but Matthew is good enough. This is where Jesus chooses the 12 disciples and sends them out on a commission. And you go to Matthew 10. Let's see if we can find the verse. Verse 6, But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 10, verse 6. And verse 7 reads, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the leopards, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received. Freely give. Freely we did receive. Because we can't do anything to earn salvation. But Christ paid the price. Don't ever, anyone ever forget that. He paid the price for your salvation. He paid the price so we can freely receive it. And we are to deliver what we freely deceive to others so they can understand what Christ did for them also on that cross. Freely receive and freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses. See, when you just take one verse like this person did, good intentions, and just state freely give as you have freely received, that all sounds wonderful in the promise box. Or if you're just trying to make your point. 
But let's not miss out in the surrounding verses. Let's keep it in context. Nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. For the workman is worthy of his meat. And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who it is, is it worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. Who wants to really hear your message? In other words. And when ye come into the house, salute it. And if the house be worthy and really wants to hear your message, let your peace come upon it. But if, the, but if it be not worthy after they invite you and they don't want to hear it, let your peace return in you. And letting your house, that means while you were there, guess what? You be taken care of. You be given housing. You could be given food. Your needs would be taken care of. That's why Christ said, don't worry about how much you take with you. Because once you get there, the ones that want to receive you, the ones that want to hear what I freely gave to you, will pay for your expenses. If you want to use modern language, they will provide for you. They will take care of you. And if they don't, you can read the rest of the verses that describes what will happen. I mean, you got to keep scriptures in context, my friend. That's why it's very hard sometimes to be in this seat to be in this position because it requires and there's a responsibility to make sure even the most sincerest people Not to go off in some goony, promise box, goose chase to justify their positions or opinions. Listen, you can read anything in God's Word and twist it if you want to cater to your opinions. What you would like it to actually say. Not what it's saying, but what you would like for it to actually say. That's why you need watchmen. You go to Ezekiel. i got to do this in just a few moments. You go to Ezekiel. thirty-three, eighteen. about the watchman's duty. I mean, excuse me, not 33, chapter 3. And there's a watchman's duty in 33 too, which we'll go back to, but I, want to, I think I'll start in chapter 3. This is Ezekiel, the Lord calling him to be a watchman. In verse 17, it says in chapter 3, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word in thy mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die. Who is Ezekiel speaking to right now? Or who the Lord is going to have? Ezekiel speak to on his behalf to the wicked when I say unto the wicked thou shalt surely die and thou givest him not warning if you don't give him warning nor speak it to the warn speak it to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life 
The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood and I will acquire at thy hand, thine hand. Now, I don't think Ezekiel and miss the opportunity to be with Jesus or God. But he would have his blood on his hands. He would be accountable if he resisted to be a watchman. Because that means someone will not get the word. Now, I don't want you to confuse that I'm relating anyone that responded to those messages as being wicked. No, I'm point, this is a different point now. And the point is, it's not easy being a watchman. And watching your messages come in sometimes and you go off in these tangents and you start interpreting the Word of God the way you think you, it should be interpreted because it fits your certain agenda and it easily packages your opinion what you want Scripture to say. Not what it actually says, but what you think it should say. Here, Ezekiel is told to be a watchman to the wicked. But that's not the only thing he was supposed to be a watchman to. So, In present day, as an under-shepherd, that is my role. But that doesn't mean you're excused from not participating in that. In a sense, you're watchmen too. You have an obligation. As that message said earlier, you just can't be couch potatoes. Now I'll go to Ezekiel 33. Another verse. And the word of the Lord of the, came unto me, saying once again, let's just go to verse 2. Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring thy sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchmen. And just, just jump down to 30, uh, uh, verse 6. But if the watchmen see the sword come, and blow not the trumpet, and the people... I'm going to write that down. First you had the wicked he was supposed to address. Now he has the people. You go back to verse 38. I mean, at verse 8 in, in, in uh, Ezekiel 33. You fast forward to verse 8. It brings up the wicked again. So you got wicked and you got people he's addressing to. Now go to back to Ezekiel chapter 3. Kind of jumping around in Ezekiel tonight. But just one more example of a watchman's responsibility to say the least of what he's supposed to address and who he's supposed to address it to. And you go to Ezekiel chapter 3 verse Hang on as I find it. Verse 20. Again, when a righteous man doeth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he had done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require in thy hand. So even the righteous he was supposed to address. Now this has different applications in the New Testament. But the watchman's responsibility is the same. You go to Ephesians chapter 4. You don't have to go there because I'm, I'm racing right now. and If you can't keep up, don't worry about it. You go to Ephesians chapter 4, and he gave some in verse 11, apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting or the completion of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of the Christ. He gave watchmen, in other words, to the saints for the work of the ministry. That means you are involved also. Till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man or a complete man, or completed man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Then 
that ye that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slay of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive or literally to lead you astray but speaking in truth and love may grow up into him in all things which is the head even Christ for the edification of the saints to bring them to completion for the employment of the word of God which is part of the ministry we're all involved in that's a watchman's duty that's what we do here we're what your Ezekiel's running loose if you think about it who we're addressing are messages to a the wicked obviously so they can have a change of mind the people in general that need a change of mind and even the righteous that get off track or have different interpretations of the Word of God that need a change of mind I mean when we bring up the subject of offerings listen it's almost laughable now when we send out these emails I get the reports back I can send out any message and we get very few unsubscribes every time we send out a message concerning giving is when we have the most unsubscribes why well there's a problem whether you're a Christian or not a Christian it's a threefold problem you have the love of money you have the love of this world you have love of darkness the light of the body is the eye remember that message that I preached I have a copy of right here of a page from the ebook that has this giving message. The light of the body is the eye, therefore that eye be single, the whole body shall be full of light. And I told you to circle the word single. The Greek word is haplus. But the definition is not single. I'm going to sk skip along because there's another thought about this word haplus or haplus. There's another thought in this word or section coming from the word in which the King James translator rendered single and the New English founders rendered sound. In some texts the words mean simple and simplicity. However, other texts say the only proper translation is generosity. Some translators recognize the meaning was generosity when translating Romans 12 verse 8. For in that verse the word simplicity used in the King James Version was changed to liberality so that, no, so that now the text reads reads, he that giveth, let him do li with liberality. To define this, in other words, we could say very generously. The Greek defines haplos as simplicity as manifested in generous giving. This verse refers to money, not the correct non incorrect nonsense of a lot of authors and commentators like to tell you. This verse has always been about money and possessions and always has been about how to give God's way. Matthew 6, 22 can now be read as the right translation, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore then I be generous, not the one of the three things I just mentioned, full of darkness, but if the light of the body is therefore thy, the eye be generous, the whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil or not generous, the whole body shall be full of darkness. Because of people's love of money and, and of this world, and the darkness that's polluted their mindset, they have lost the wonder of opportunity to express haplus, generous giving. Generous giving, which enlightens you because you become full of light. I bring it back to Matthew 6. Why? because of our obedience to Christ when he gave us the command commandment to lay up our treasures 
in heaven. Lay up our treasures in heaven, folks. It says nothing strange that I'm preaching to you. Many of you that have been around know this inside and out. I will make the final decision what I'm going to do. I'm leaning towards never to charge anything, whether at cost or whatever, for the teaching. But I won't have you insult the Word of God continuously by your lack of participation. If you're here in this ministry, and if you're listening as many of you do, and not responding in any way, whether it's giving or just communication of verbal written emails, I mean, uh, written emails or verbal f phone conversations that you can leave on a voicemail. You have a problem. You have a problem. You don't want to expose yourself because you don't want to be giving. It's plain and simple. You want to be in that room full of darkness. You don't want no one to turn the light on. Because once you turn the light on, it might change you. It might become a funnel. You might finally experience Agatha Sunni giving, which is an attribute of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.23. Come on, folks. Stop trying to disguise your actions as something that is you think is scriptural. You're just protecting yourself because there's so many sh shysters out there full of their shenanigans that are polluting God's word with this prosperity gospel. Prosperity gospel. It's not taught here. What's taught here is the right way of giving. And as watchmen, and this is your responsibility too, some of you have individuals that watch in your house that refuse to participate, whatever the reason is. Well, they're not full-time listeners. They're not full-time watchers of the services that we provide here. Do you have to be? Do you have to be? Your heart is not full of generous giving. You have no generosity about you. You only have self-preservation, hanging on to the little you might have, thinking that you're going to save it for a rainy day because you never know what's going to come around the corner with this economy or with the disasters that are facing this world. God's not been your provider. You have. And you've done a piss poor job of it for most of, for most of you out there that have that attitude. It's time to call out people, friends. That's what watchmen do. That's why I went to these scriptures quickly. And I gave you three different categories, and even the righteous were one of the categories. It's our responsibility. If someone's living in your house, and I'm going to touch some feelings tonight, and don't want to participate but they're living free off of you, guess what? Time to make them step up and play the man or be the man or the woman and say to them, since you want to participate, guess what? I'm going to charge you rent or whatever your situation. I don't know what some of you go situations are. But I guarantee you someone has that kind of situation tonight. That's probably listened to me or listened to a rerun. If you won't give, I'm going to charge you rent and I'm going to give what I get from that rent or a portion of it or whatever your decision is. Enough's enough. It could be loved ones, it could be friends, it could be whoever. Stop thinking it's not your responsibility to be watchmen. Stop putting all the burden on me. I'll carry the load. And don't let them twist scriptures, take it out of context to justify their sick opinion of what they think God's Word says. For over a year and a half, I've tried to gently nudge people 
into their responsibilities of not being couch potatoes, but be active participants pleasing the Lord. It's not worked. It's not worked. And if it turns you off or offends you, then maybe you need to go. Because the old watchman is coming back. You got it? If you do, play a song. Let me know.